I was going through an old diary of mine, and found an entry I made ten years ago to the day, in which I'd written about the time I got thoroughly creeped out at the train station. So, on this creepy anniversary, let me recount the tale for you. First, a bit about myself. I'm a woman, and had recently turned 18 when this story took place, though I looked a fair bit younger. People frequently assumed I was 16, partly because of my baby face genetics, but also because I had stupid low self-esteem at the time, and I looked like a high school sophomore who didn't know how to dress themselves. I was tall and fat, and not into makeup, and my idea of doing my hair was pulling an unbrushed mass into a ponytail. Fashion was t-shirts with pop culture references on it, and jeans I hadn't washed in a month. I was hardly the prized pig at a fair. This dunking on myself will become relevant later, I promise. Anyway, I was coming home from uni, and I needed to switch trains at South Yara Station. My next train wasn't due to arrive for another 15 minutes, so I was hanging around the station cafe, wondering if I really needed a potato cake. I was deep in thought about this, when I felt someone sidle up right next to me. I could feel their presence over my shoulder, so I stepped to the side, thinking they were trying to get past me, but they didn't move around. They shuffled closer, so that we were less than a foot apart, and muttered something to me. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What was that? I asked, turning around. I said, do you want to get a coffee? Oh, the forwardness of the question kind of stumped me. So I stood there for a moment, looking at the guy who'd approached me out the blue. He was pretty normal looking, to be honest. Clean shaven, casual dressed, medium length hair, looked to be to his mid early thirties, was kind of weedy and a little taller than I, making him quite tall because I'm six foot myself. And he had a nervous demeanor about him, like he couldn't seem to look me in the eye. Aside from his abruptness, nothing about him seemed out of the ordinary. He glanced at me, waiting for an answer to his question. My creep alarms weren't ringing, but I still wasn't in the habit of going out for drinks with strangers. Coffee? Uh, now's not a great time for me, I said, with an apologetic shrug. I've got to catch a train. Oh. He looked down again. Do you have to? That's weird. But I insisted that I indeed had to, because I was on my way to an appointment. A barefaced lie. But whatever got me out of this conversation quicker. Then the questions started. So, what kind? He asked. What? What kind of appointment? Uh, dentist. Right, right. What train are you getting? Uh, the one to Sandringham. Oh, I'm going to Alamein. Ha! <laughs> Opposite direction. Ah, uh, yeah. Anyway, my train's leaving in a few minutes, so I really should be heading off. What about tomorrow? What? Can we go for a coffee tomorrow? At 10? Oh, I don't know. I've got school. You can skip it, right? Ah, well, it's the first week, so I kind of have to go. How about after? I think I'm meeting some friends after that, actually. Oh, but you can cancel with them, right? They'll understand. I... I guess so? At this point, the guy chuckled and shook his head. He nudged my arm with his elbow. I am hitting on you, you know. Remember what I said about not being the prize pig? I was a depressed, insecure teenager who'd never been hit on before in her life. And when he said those words, something in my brain shifted. I spent years believing I was fundamentally unlovable. I stayed in toxic friendships because I didn't think I deserved any better. 
and I should be grateful for any attention I got. It's like I was an orphan in a Dickens novel, and I had to cling to any crust of affection thrown my way, because I didn't know where my next meal was coming from. Those feelings surged up, and the whole encounter with this dude flipped. He was no longer a stranger pestering me for coffee. No. Suddenly, he was someone to whom I owed a debt. He was benevolent enough to find someone like me attractive. Therefore, I owed him. I smiled nervously. Sorry. This is just the first time something like this happens to me, so... Well, there's a first time for everything, he said. Anyway, he kept asking me to meet him for coffee out in Hurstbridge, which is a train station 30 kilometres out of the Melbourne CBD. For all of you non-Melbournians out there, it's also an hour's trip by train. But like I said, I felt like I owed him, so I agreed. I told this guy I'd see what I can do, and he asked me about five times to promise him I'd be there. Then he said something I didn't quite catch. It sounded like he said, I've already had some partners, is that okay? And I assumed he meant he'd been with people before, so he wasn't a complete novice, as opposed to me, who just admitted this was the first time that they'd been hit on. I said it was totally fine. But what he actually said was, I already have some partners. And when I said it was fine, he smirked to himself. Oh, that's fine, eh? You like that too? He nodded. Nice, nice. Haha. <laughs> Finally, I'm promiscuous. I didn't even know what to say to that. Did he mean polyamorous? No clue. My train had just started pulling in. So I took a step towards the ramp down to the station, giving him a hasty goodbye. He was standing in my way and didn't move when I indicated I wanted to get past. You'll meet me tomorrow at Hurstbridge, right? At 12. You promise. Promise. I said, yes, fine, whatever. But he didn't move. He stuck out his hand for me to shake. I'm James, by the way. I'm Meg, I say giving him the nickname of one of my fantasy role-playing OCs. As I reached out to shake his hand, he pulled me into a hug. I don't even like being hugged by my own family members, so this caught me completely off guard, and I could do nothing but stand there as his hand rubbed up and down my back, lingered on where he felt my bra strap through my shirt, and he continued to hug me even after my arms dropped down to my sides and I stood frozen watching my train leave the station. Oh no, he said, finally ending the embrace. Did you miss your train? It's okay. The next one's in 15 minutes. I'll wait for you. And I didn't know what to do, because I did not want to be around him anymore. But I still felt like I owed him something. Politeness, at least. There was another train leaving the station in a few minutes, and it wasn't on my line, but I just wanted to be out of there. I told James I could catch that train instead, and take a bus to my appointment, so he didn't need to wait with me. But he insisted. He reached down and held my hand as he walked towards the train station. Oh cool, he said, when he saw there was a train going. I'm going to Frankston. We can go there together. He told me earlier he was going to Alamein. Completely different line. My hand went limp in his grasp. He didn't let go. My brain was buzzing with plans of how to get out of this situation. I wanted to tell him to piss off, but part of me didn't see that he'd done anything wrong. He was socially awkward and overly friendly, and he'd asked me out for a coffee. Those weren't bad things. If anything, I was the bad guy for not giving him a chance. It's not like guys were beating down a path at my door. I'd be lucky if someone was interested in me at all. Like, I could go up to the train station staff and say, Help, this man asked me out for a coffee and gave me a goodbye hug. Get a grip. I was thinking too hard to pay attention to what James was saying. 
but I eventually tuned in and realised he was talking to me about school. He asked if it was a casual day at school, or did my school not have uniforms, or if I was skipping today. He said, with a fond chuckle, that he used to go home at lunch and skip school all the time. Good God, did he think I was still in high school? I clarified and told him that I was actually at uni, and he said, oh, and dropped the subject. The train arrived, and since it was peak hour, it was packed. Part of me was hoping that in the rush hour of people, James and I would get separated, but no such luck. He pulled me on board and we ended up squished together, me with my back against the doors, and him blocking me into a corner. The doors on my side weren't opening for a while. If I wanted to rush out another step, I'd have to elbow my way through the crowded carriage. But even if I told James I needed to get off the train, he could block my exit again and pull me into another hug until the doors closed. He didn't tell me what stop he was getting off at either, so he could just say he needed to get off at my stop too and follow me wherever I happened to go. James essentially had me trapped. At this point, I was barely paying attention to anything he was saying. I was too busy focusing on potential escape plans. So far, the best idea I had was to spontaneously throw up on him and make my escape in the disgusted confusion. But unfortunately, I was blessed with an iron stomach and hadn't vomited in 11 years. So maybe not the best idea. I thought about faking a phone call, but he was close enough to see my phone screen and know no one was on the line. In retrospect, I could have pretended to text or something, but hindsight, you know? James leaned in a little closer and patted me on the arm. You excited about tomorrow? Our date? Coffee? You promised, right? Right. You did promise he said, and looked me in the eyes. He hadn't done much of that through our entire conversation, so it startled me. You promised. I nodded, unsure of what else to do. I've been hurt before, you know, he said, looking back down at the ground. It's not nice. He sounded so woebegone that I felt bad for being so creeped out by him. Maybe he was just really socially awkward and had a hard time getting dates. Maybe this was him trying his best. As a fellow socially awkward person, surely I could understand the struggles. Surely I could give him a chance. James glanced up and down at me. So, what are you going to wear to our coffee date? Ha, <laughs> how will I recognize you? I shrugged. I'll probably wear this, I guess. It was quite hot that day, and I was wearing lace-up sandals I'd borrowed from my mum. Might class it up with some socks, shoes, maybe a hat. Hey, you know what I like? I like those really long socks. You know what I mean? Oh, like thigh highs. I think I have a pair of those. Yeah, I like thigh highs. I have a fetish for them. <laughs> yeah, he's just real awkward. You've got to be polite and give him a chance. James nodded to himself. The thigh highs and those uh, uniforms with the short skirts. I like those. Mm-hmm. He's just trying his best. Benefit of the doubt and all. I owe him that much. Hey, James said, chuckling and leaning in closer. I've told you two of my fetishes. You tell me two of yours. I looked at him, like he just asked me to hand over two of my teeth. I stammered, something like, oh, well, I don't know about that. But he chided me and gently bumped me on the shoulder. Come on, he wielded. It's fine. I won't judge, even if it's nasty. 
I've only told you two of my tamer ones. I can get really kinky, you know. <laughs> Do you want me to guess what yours are? I think I said something about how he can't guess because I don't have any. And he must have picked up on the curtness of my tone. Because he started hushing and reassuring me that it was fine. He's done a lot of that stuff before. And that a lot of girls don't think they're into it at first. But if it's done right, then they change their minds. I said, I bet. And I resumed looking out the window. The train whistled as we pulled into a station. The next stop. I knew it faced my side of the carriage. So the doors would open and I'd have an out. I didn't want James to think I was mad at him or wanted to leave in case he tried to stop me. So when he started making small talk again, I participated with Ernest. He didn't talk about fetishes, but he did keep touching me, brushing my arm, patting the back of my hand, resting his hand on my hip, and didn't seem to care that I didn't reciprocate his and touch, and in some cases visibly pulled away. We arrived at the next stop, and the doors opened behind me. The carriage was less crowded than it had been when we first got on, and a few more people filled out. I stretched and moved into the newfound space, and James leaned back a fraction to avoid getting hit in the face with my arm. I told him to back up a smidge because I needed to tighten the laces of my sandals. He obliged, and I bent over, turning to the right a little, so that I was parallel to the door. I tugged aimlessly at the string, waiting until the door started beeping, so that they were about to close, and then I lunged out. My hip banged against the door just as it slid shut, so I kind of staggered and stumbled out the carriage, but I was out before James registered what happened. I turned and watched him approach the closed doors, repeatedly pressing the button to open them. In retrospect, I shouldn't have stopped because I had no plan of what to do next if the doors opened and let him out. Fortunately, he'd waited just a second too long, because the train had already started to move. We locked eyes. He stared at me, his face cold and expressionless as the train pulled away. I wanted to get on a train going back the other way I'd just come, but it wasn't coming for another ten minutes, which would be more than enough time for James to get off at the next stop, and bought the same train coming back this way. I could walk around the block a few times and wait for a few trains to go past, but what if he came back here and started looking for me? Or, if I did manage to avoid him at this station, who's to say he wouldn't try and find me in South Yara, where we'd first met? Fortunately, there was a tram line close by, so I decided to screw that bullshit train and get out of Dodge on the light rail. As it turned out, that tram ended up going past a stop on the train line I wanted to go out on in the first place, so I was able to make it home without too much hassle, albeit an hour later. For the longest time, I thought I was overreacting, and that he was just an awkward guy with an odd approach to picking up women. It was my fault if it got as far as it did because I was only giving him soft nose, like making excuses to leave and pulling away from his touch. I was equally in the wrong because my no wasn't explicit, even though my brain was screaming at me to be polite and that I owed him niceness for daring to take an interest in me. It wasn't until years later did I realize how warped that line of thinking was. And it also took me a while for me to really piece together the fact that he asked me out on a date, while assuming I was still in high school, and then later told me about his schoolgirl uniform fetish, which is not a great look. And also, regardless if I was 18 or 28, he still prevented me from catching my train in the first place. He pulled me into a hug without asking, and continued to hug me even when I stopped reciprocating, and only let go when he heard the train leave. 
He knew I needed to go, and he wouldn't let me. That's hella messed up. I never did see James again, but I was paranoid about swapping trains at South Yara Station for the longest time, and I still haven't been to Hertzbridge. During my freshman year of college in New Hampshire, a girl in my dorm hall accidentally caused a small dorm room fire by leaving popcorn in too long at about 3am. We all had to evacuate, and the fire trucks came and the RAs made a pretty big stink about it. The girl who lit the fire was the subject of many yik-yak jokes, and I felt bad for her because she really wasn't attractive, and she looked pathetically lonely. And plus, causing microwave fires seemed like a pretty innocent mistake for such harsh comments. A couple of days after the incident, I saw her in the restaurant hall, and made casual small talk by asking her how things were popping, and kind of just checking up on her because I felt bad. She laughed, and that was kind of it. A conversation of about two minutes. Fast forward to a week later, and I hear a knock at my dorm door, and it's the same girl who I am now going to refer to as Popcorn. She comes literally running into my room with no hesitation. I didn't even tell her my room number, and at the time, I just figured she just saw me go in there once, because she didn't even know my name at this point. It takes me a second to realize that she is in full-blown tears. There is now a stranger on my bed in tears, and I'm just like, ugh. So I counsel her like the bleeding heart I am, and ask her what's wrong. She tells me that one of the dining hall cooks sexually assaulted her and the college wouldn't fire him, and she was suffering emotionally because of it. Being a victim of assault myself, I really sympathized with her situation, and gave her my phone number in case she needed help walking to the dining hall with a safety net and whatnot. I don't take sexual assault lightly. The night after our conversation in my room, I got a call from her to walk her down to the dining hall, because that same cook that assaulted her was working that day. I walked her down to get food, and she lit up like a glow stick, and a whole new person emerged. It didn't matter that her assailant was in the room. She was talking my ear off about pretty little liars, one direction, etc, etc. A lot of things I just didn't really care about, but then again, she had no one to talk to, and the situation was complicated. I just listened and nodded my head. Over the course of about two weeks, give or take, I had walked her down to the dining hall maybe four or five times. She may have been a victim of assault, but she was also very annoying and unappealing. For God's sake, she actually talked about herself in the third person. Her story about the assault became inconsistent, and there was always new major developments about what happened, and then the story changed to something much more drastic and severe. It went from assault to bringing in a gang to do the same thing to her. Then, she made a comment one day along the lines of how she wished that someone would drop a bomb and kill all the people of the race of the assailant so that they could stop. It made me immediately uncomfortable and unsettled. I didn't want to walk her or interact with her anymore. The week of Thanksgiving reprieve, I went back home to visit my family while Popcorn stayed on campus. During that week, I had 60 missed phone calls from Popcorn. One day, I even had 20 calls within the span of a couple of hours. No normal person does that. Red flags were definitely raising if they hadn't been already. When I got back to campus, there was a knock on my door, 
and sure enough it was Popcorn crying again. She tells me that because I wasn't on campus to protect her, she had been assaulted by another guy while walking to Panera Bread, and the Filipino RA groped and slapped her. If red flags were being raised, then this was on four sirens. I'm no apologist by any means when it comes to sexual assault, but the ratio of sexual assault was incredibly high, especially since these three incidents happened within a month's time frame, all by people of colour seemingly at random. She was making up these stories to elicit some sick form of sympathy, and as an actual victim of assault, I was beyond offended. I told her I had to leave for class, and ran the hell away from her to my friend to ask for advice. It got really crazy really fast. I warned the RA officers about her, and they told me that they would talk to her. During class, I had up to a hundred plus missed phone calls, and a series of individual messages that just said, Hi. I was done with this. I wanted nothing to do with her. I blocked her number and went back to my dorm. That week after classes, I just went straight to my dorm. I didn't want to see her. One day I had to go to the bathroom, so I walked to the stall to do my business. I'm just casually in there peeing with my pants around my ankles when Popcorn literally crawls on the bathroom floor and claps her head underneath the stall and says, Ha! I knew you would eventually come out. I am freaked the hell out and nearly in tears. I tell her I am wickedly busy, and I don't have time for her, and that I was upset for her invading my privacy. That took a lot of courage to do, because I was struggling deeply with confrontation. She tells me about how she is thinking of dying, because her mum died when she was young. Some manipulative shit that I was just not in the mood for. I leave her in the bathroom, and go to my room and lock the door. I watch some YouTube and take a nap. When I was rudely awoken, not by knocking, but by pounding on my door. I didn't answer. And the pounding continued and got louder and louder. Open this door, or I am going to kill you. Open the door, or I will kill you. It went on and on. She just waited outside my dorm, singing songs into the door cracks for an hour. I was so scared I just cried and called my dad to pick me up from school. I didn't have many friends that lived on campus, since it was a small college and lots of people commuted, and this whole situation just made me feel isolated. My mental health was deteriorating rapidly. The RAs had been informed of the threats made at my door by other students observing what happened, and she was given a warning, but that was all. One night, I had my boyfriend, who lived three hours away at this time, come and spend the night at college. We'd been watching a movie, and now we're napping on my bed, when all we hear is the door open. Like an idiot, I had completely spaced out and forgotten to lock the door. Popcorn comes running in and jumped on top of us, saying in a baby voice, Popcorn wants cuddles. I was beyond creeped out and was basically screaming. My boyfriend, being the no-nonsense confrontational person he is, told her to get the absolute hell out of my room. She told him that she would, and I quote, just go and die like her mother did when she was three and inject cancer into herself. My boyfriend smiled and said, Good! And then pushed her out of the room and slammed the door, giving zero shits. I swear he almost slammed her fingers shut. I love him. We reported her to the campus police in the morning, and still nothing major came of it. That was until there was another popcorn fire in her dorm, and not too far after, she got kicked out. I wish that's where the story would end. But with her, unfortunately, no. After she left the dorms, my resident life became a lot easier. I made a lot of new normal friends, 
and I was feeling a lot less anxious. One day, a girl in one of my classes invites me to go to the mall with her, to go get our nails done. Now this nail salon had clear glass, so you could see the rest of the outside mall when you were getting your nails done. I am all relaxed, when all of a sudden, I see Popcorn's face pressed up against the glass of the nail salon, and she is with a morbidly obese neck beard. I'm getting my nails done, and she's literally staring at me through the window for a good ten minutes with this man. To say that I was unnerved was an understatement. I told my friend what was going on, and we booked it out of there, and they tried hard to follow. In retrospect, that is when I should have called the real police. After the mall, I had a bunch of random friend requests from profiles with a small Yorkie dog as the profile picture, and several message requests. I opened them, and they were all from Popcorn, asking for me to be her bridesmaid at a Pizza Hut wedding that her and her fiancé were having in two years. You can't even make this shit up. There was another message about how she was so upset that I didn't acknowledge her at the mall, and she had waited so long to introduce me to her doting fiancé, and she was so upset that she wanted to wring my neck. Of course, I blocked all those profiles, and things were pretty silent. I've been living with my boyfriend and going to school in Rhode Island for two years currently. I'm loving school and have an excellent group of friends. About five months ago, I had got homework and I had three missed calls from a random New Hampshire number. Thinking it was one of my family members, I called back and nope, it was popcorn on the other end. I immediately hung up. There was also a voicemail left that was just a person breathing into the phone and telling me that I was expected at the wedding. I cried and called the police urgently about the number. I don't know what happened or if anything did come of it, but I haven't been bothered since. I'm a very kind person and people often take advantage of my openness. It really is a fatal flaw that I am working really hard on. It's unfortunate that there are so many unhinged and lowly people, but we really shouldn't make it our burden to help them. Sometimes being nice actually causes a lot of mental strain. To Popcorn, let's not meet again. This happened around 2012. But I remember most of what happened clear as day. I worked with my girlfriend at a busy restaurant. We worked all the time, and it was stressful. We took off a few days and decided to fly somewhere to get away from work people and the town in general. I found decent deals and flights to Ocean City for two nights. She'd never been on a plane. We loved the beach, and I could hit up all the local crab cake spots. It was perfect. We flew into Baltimore and rented a car to drive to OC. Nothing memorable happened on the first day. We laid on the beach, hit up all the local shops, and had forgettable food. The second day, we woke up and went to the most recommended stop for crab cakes, and on the way back, we stopped and got crab cakes to go from two other recommended places for later. We stopped by the hotel to drop off the food and went to the hotel bar for a few drinks. Note, my girlfriend at the time was a smoker and I hated it. She would also attract attention from guys, which I would deal with but wasn't thrilled about. We go to the rooftop bar at the hotel and the bar itself is a four-sided island in the middle of the patio. It's probably 2 p.m. and a clear sunny day. We pull up chairs and there's only a few women on the left side of the bar and a guy bartends behind it. 
we got obligatory house margaritas. And after her first drink, my girlfriend felt like she wanted to smoke. But the girls and the bartender didn't have one to bum her. We got refills and schmoozed with the bartender about the area and things to do, but mainly kept to ourselves. The bartender seemed as if he was being fake. Something was off, and I couldn't put my finger on it. A feeling of, I don't really even want to run to the restroom and leave her here at the bar, because I don't trust something. More than a few times, he asked us if we were staying at the hotel. I think I said no, but my girlfriend said yes. He asked us which room at one point. My girlfriend went to use the restroom, and a minute later I heard Guy's voices. I didn't realise there were a group of three or four guys that sat at a table directly behind us. They were either playing cards, or just smoking. But they made some comments to her when she walked back. Great. We finished our drinks, and were googling tropical drinks for her, and area hotspots to check out. The guys came up on either side of us and talked to the bartender and got beers. You could tell they were either friends or regulars. I honestly couldn't tell you if they were there when we came to the bar, or came after, but they had a sleazy vibe. Me and the girlfriend ended up talking to the only other couple at the bar that had come and sat down. It was nice to be away and just relax. We always liked making new friends. I didn't realise, but one of the guys came up and either brushed against my girlfriend or made a comment, and it rubbed her the wrong way. So in her infinite wisdom, she wanted to be bothersome to them, and got up and asked them to bum a smoke. I didn't realise it until I turned around, and she was there, talking to the guy with his shirt unbuttoned, and gold chains hanging on his chest hair forest. I didn't want her associating with them, but if one gave her a smoke, I would get the guy a beer, if it meant we didn't have to leave the bar to hit a store for smokes. She came back without a cigarette, mad. Apparently, the guys kept asking, What's in it for us? And said, your boyfriend wants to fight us. Why would we give you anything? I didn't want to fight them. I was on vacation, and I wasn't paying attention to them. But I didn't like the implications of the other comment. At all. Because we had a lacklustre first day, I wanted to pack in fun things this day. So this drink was my last one. I asked for the tab, and the guy with a couple we met gave us his business card, and said we should meet up with him and his girlfriend at Secrets at 8pm. The guys behind us kind of swarmed on all sides of us, and slammed down a pack of cigarettes, with two smokes left inside of it, in between both me and my girlfriend. They said something like, here, then they ordered another round. We found it odd, but thanked them and offered a shot. I don't think they even replied. One asked if we were vacationing, then asked if we were staying at the hotel, then took the round of beers back to the table. I had a weird feeling, as if they were locals and didn't like us because we were visitors. Turning back to the bar, my drink was now completely full. Stupid me didn't even question it. I didn't want a refill, but I figured the bartender topped me up. I took a sip, and the drink was strong. I just closed out, so maybe it was a thank you for the tip? It was disgustingly strong, like rubbing alcohol, maybe even turpentine. I told my girl to try it. Boozy Susie over here takes a huge pull from my drink and nearly spits it back out. It was gross. She made a face, and said that it shouldn't taste like that. I couldn't even ask the bartender about it. He was gone. I don't know where he disappeared, but he was nowhere to be found. I can't remember if I finished the nasty thing anyway. 
My girl said something along the lines of, The guys are staring. Let's go. I was originally worried she was going to chat them up and thank them before we left. But she said she felt weird. The whole vibe changed. She wanted out. I remember spending a minute or two saying bye to the couple we were going to meet later and heading towards the doors into the hotel. The guys weren't at their table. Patio door, elevator, hotel room door, bed. My eyes open and I turn my head right. The alarm clock reads 3am. I am face down in bed on top of the covers. I push myself up, slide back off the bed and stand up. The sliding glass doors are wide open, as are the screen doors to the balcony. There's a breeze. I think, did my girlfriend jump off a balcony? And in that millisecond, I hear crying behind me. My girlfriend is sitting Indian style on the floor with a clamshell of what was about $40 worth of crab cakes in her lap, crying. She said she couldn't wake me up. She asked me if I remember what happened. She said she had been sick and throwing up for four hours non-stop. What the hell happened? I bent over to sit down with her and got hit with a wave of sickness. I ran and was in that bathroom for hours puking. By the time I came out, she was asleep and passed out. This had to be a bad dream. I remember thinking that maybe we went to the club and got wasted and I blacked out, and I went back to bed. We both woke up at 7am to our alarms. We had to take the rental to Baltimore and catch a flight back. We both had to be at work at 2 today. I was shaking. She looked like hell, and we both felt like death. She was shook. She said the walk back to the hotel room was scary and she didn't remember anything after. Wait, what? According to her, when we walked into the hotel from the patio bar, one of the guys was at a chair near the elevators. He said something to us, but the doors closed quickly. She said when we got to our floor, two of the guys were at the end of the hall, heading towards us. She said that we got into the room and they stood outside our door and she thinks they knocked. Apparently, I laid on the bed and immediately was lights out. She couldn't wake me and passed out herself until she woke up to violently vomit for hours. My body was shot. I was shaking. And now I'm processing that these scumbags may have followed us to our room. Part of me thought she was exaggerating. But you know how you have weird slow motion flashbacks? Well, as I was greying out on the way to the hotel room, I remember one of the guys being by the elevator. Also, as she was brushing her teeth, her mouth was blue. I went to the mirror. So was mine. Neon blue. Nothing we had that day was blue. I had green light margaritas and vodka root beers. This was proof that something fishy had to have happened. We didn't know what to do. We had to get back. We couldn't stick around. We got to the car. I barely felt okay to drive, but I wanted to be home. We felt dirty. We were confused. And we wanted out of MD and swore we were never coming back. We missed our flight, explained the situation to the desk, and somehow got put on another flight back home. We sat in the airport for hours, dying. The flight was painful too. We made it to work a few hours late that day. Nobody believed our story and thought we made it up to justify for being late. And we kind of never brought it up again. I googled to see if similar situations happened and found nothing. We googled blue tongue and saw it's a side effect of a drug. I'll be honest, I felt lucky we made it out of OC. I don't know if we were a target of a room invasion or robbery, or if they wanted to attack 
and take my girlfriend. It could have turned out ugly in a lot of different ways. What if my girlfriend didn't take a huge swig? What if I drunk the whole thing by myself? How close did I come to an overdose or death? Depending on the drug and its interactions with alcohol. I swear the bartender was in on it. I did call the hotel and ask if there was any issues with people being drugged or room robberies and they said that they've had zero incidents and I think I let it go. I emailed the hotel from a throwaway email I created and told them to watch the hotel roof bar bartender and never got a reply. I realize that it's a lot to take in, but that's my story and I think about it any time someone brings up OC. My husband and I trade off planning our anniversaries and sometimes we do themed trips. A few years ago, it was his turn to organize and he picked a winner. You see, ever since I was a kid, I'd experienced odd things and being very scientific, I liked to investigate such things in my own way. He's a scientist who loves Halloween. We get along in that way. When he told me that we were going to have a ghost themed anniversary, I was stoked. We stayed at the Queen Anne Hotel in San Francisco, which is renowned for being haunted. One room in particular, room 314 was the most active, and this was the room my husband had booked. The hotel was originally built for Mary Lake as a girls school called Lake Seminary, and is, as the name suggests, a large, beautiful Victorian building. The haunted room was supposed to have been the headmistress Lake's office. I knew from research and videos on YouTube that people often reported objects moving, voices of a woman, and orbs and stuff. I'd also heard it was pretty reliable. One of those rare spots where most groups catch at least a glimpse of some activity. That kind of thing always make my skeptic brain go nuts, because I start to wonder if it's faked, if it's psychological, and I just want to get in there and roll my sleeves up. I brought my standard kit, digital recorder, camera, infrared thermometer, EMF meter, and a bunch of other random stuff. We were there for part of the afternoon, taking measurements and wandering around trying to get a feel for the place. I lay out some trigger objects, which were supposed to be things that a ghost might like moving. Everyone said they thought the spirit was originally the headmistress, so I put out cosmetics, brushes, perfume, and things that might remind a woman of her life. We went out to meet a haunted tour of the city, and I left everything set up. Turned out the haunted tour stopped by our hotel, and gave a brief rundown of the hotel and the room. I raised my hand and said, I'm renting that room if anyone wants to go in. And so the tour guide, overjoyed that they'd have access to the room, took the tour into my room. As we entered, I turned on the lights. The guide is going on about how people often see things through their phones and cameras that they don't see with their eyes. I thought, wow, how cool, and took out my phone. I lifted to take a flash picture, and saw so in that second, a weird grey ball shoot across the screen. The guide, who was standing behind me, said, Oh my god, did you catch it? Sadly, I didn't hit the button fast enough, so no picture. I've never been much one for orbs, because I know what dust can do to light refraction. But this was a massive grey ball. It didn't glow. It just moved past the screen, as tangible as a tennis ball, and though I've toyed with my iPhone to duplicate that, I can't. It wasn't dust. So after the tour, we headed back to the hotel. 
laying in bed, I do some EVP stuff and sit there, staring at my instruments until I'm exhausted. My husband has already gone to sleep and I finally decided to call it a night. Now on either side of the bed, a massive, wrought iron and marble topped side tables, each about two square foot. They're sturdy, they don't move, and both have a single large metal lamp on them. The power outlet was on my side on the wall, about two feet away, as my husband had already plugged in his phone. His phone was in a slick plastic case. My phone, however, had a thick, rubber, non-stick outer case on it, because I'm always dropping the damn thing. I plugged my phone in, and let it sit right beside his, on the corner of the table. Both phones had plenty of slack in their cords, and were a few inches from the edge. I turned out the light, and laid down. I was laying there for ten seconds, when I remembered I'd forgotten to check our reservation for a tour the next day. I sat back up, turned on the light, and reached for my phone. It wasn't there. My husband's phone was there, but my phone was gone. I looked around, utterly confused, and to my surprise, I found my phone laying on the ground about four feet away, still plugged in resting right against the baseboard. I froze and got goosebumps all over, because I realised there'd be no way for it to fall without me hearing it. It would have hit the ground and bounced into place, finally hitting the wall. How could it have slipped off in its non-slick case, while my husband's phone in the exact same configuration was still sitting there, and for it to be flat against the wall? Impossible. I couldn't even throw it and make it do that. It was as if someone had picked it up, walked it over there, and gently set it in place without making a single sound. I elbowed my husband so hard, he sat bolt upright. I hurriedly told him what happened, as he sat there blurry-eyed and confused. When I pointed at the phone, and he saw what I saw, he very dutifully asked me if I wanted to switch sides of the bed. He's a good man, my husband. I practically jumped across the bed. I was still covered in goosebumps, and felt like I had ice in my veins. I was physically shaking, so he bundled and wrapped me up in the blankets and held me tightly. We had been cuddled together, so falling back to sleep, and me thinking, how the hell am I supposed to sleep tonight? for about 30 seconds. When I shit you not, plain as day from that space between the bed and the power outlet, we hear a little girl giggle and say, Hello? I jolted, and I felt my husband's whole body startle. After a few seconds, I tilt my head. He whispered, I heard it too. I didn't sleep that night. The hotel did not disappoint. Wandering around, we had a few more odd things happen. Once, while we were sitting in an old church pew at the end of the corridor, the window on the hall slammed open. There was no one there. In our last hour there, we were sitting on the second floor landing beside the elevator with our recording devices. My husband said, well, should we head out? I agreed. I stood up, and with a little bing, the elevator opened for us. Trouble is, elevators don't arrive at a floor unless they've been called, and not a soul had gone past us to do such a thing. I went to the front desk right away, thinking that the clerk had heard us talking, and had sent the elevator up by getting us and hitting the button for the second floor. I said, thank you for doing that. She looked at me, as if I'd grown a third arm, and said, What? I told her the elevator had opened for us, and I thought that she had sent it up. She shook her head. You saw me. I was in the back when you came out here. I've been doing paperwork in there for an hour. 
no one has come in and out for over an hour. I got home and dove into analysing the recordings I'd made and doing research. I found it odd that I hadn't found anyone who thought the haunting might be a girl. Everyone said it was a woman, but it was a girl's school, and sometimes children die of diseases, especially in the 1880s. I tried to find anyone who died while attending the seminary, but I had no luck. On the first evening, when I'd set up the room and everything, I had been sitting on the bed, talking to the recorder, while my husband got ready to leave for the haunted tour. I'd put the digital recorder dead centre on the bed, because it was pretty stable, and I thought the blanket might help dampen random street noises, which you could just barely hear. I was trying to explain what the digital recorder was, but in a way I would feel understandable to someone from the 1800s because no one ever does that on television, and it annoys the crap out of me. How is a person who died in 1755 supposed to know the words recording, or play, or playback, or whatever it means? For them, those words have different contexts. So I was picking my words carefully. I said, this tiny metal box here is a machine. It can hear things I can't like a gramophone or a ponygraphic cylinder. It can transcribe noises, voices, words, so that even if I can't hear you now, I can check the recording later and it will play for me. Everything it hears. So you can speak if you want to, and even if I can't hear you now, I will be able to hear you later. At that exact moment, very loudly, as if they are closer to the device than I, a female voice says, Ah, in that excited or enlightened way that indicates understanding. It was the only recording of an EVP and happened in the first 30 minutes we were there. After that moment, we were basically followed around and every crazy thing the ghost could manage, it did. I just wished I'd had a video camera instead of a still camera that night, so that I could have captured the phone being moved and the little girl laughing. That was seriously the coolest and most unexplainable thing I've gone through with another person there to witness it. My husband wants to go back. I'm not so sure. So if you ever get to stay in room 314 of the Queen Anne, don't plan on sleeping. This experience happened on the previous divisions I worked on. I worked the 110 mile mainland between Kingsport, Tennessee and Shelby, Kentucky. This route goes through the Appalachian Mountains and also passes through the coal fields and mines that once had the area's dead economy booming. This is now one of the poorest areas in America. You often see almost unlivable shacks, with families in them along the tracks. When I was a young blood, the old heads and locals told me of the folklore and tales of the mountains. Just figured I was getting hazed since I'd now been there 15 years and had never seen any of it. Well, until now. I got a call for a train out of Kingsport for 9pm. I arrive at the yard office at 8.30 and greeted my conductor. He was just out of training and this was going to be his first trip. His name was Chris and after a short conversation, I thought I'd like working with him. We boarded up the locomotive and by about 9.30pm, we were given the track warrants and green lighted to leave. I notched the throttle back and let her eat. As an engineer, you have to constantly be aware of your surroundings. After leaving, I noticed a little movement in the second unit. Damn hobos, I said. We ended up having to take siding just before going into Virginia and meet another train. I took the opportunity to investigate the movement in the second unit. 
I turned on the locomotive cab lights and looked around. Engineer seat, clear. Conductor seat, clear. Out of random bodily urge, I went to the engine bathroom to urinate. I unzipped my pants and opened the door to find a 25-year-old young man huddled on the ground, shivering. It was the middle of winter, December 23rd to be exact. I got him up, showed him how to work the heater, and sat him down. He was trying to get a big stone gap. Virginia for Christmas, I said. You're in luck. We'll slow down, so you can get off there. He smiled and thanked me, and I went back to the lead unit because we had been given the green signal to leave. We were going through the most rural areas of the route from this point on. It takes a strong mind to do this. The loneliness, the nighttime silence, only being broken by your conductor's voice calling signals, and the miles of open tracks and darkness can get to a weak constitution. Around 3 a.m., we were approaching Natural Tunnel. All of it is about a two-mile-long cave the railroad built track through. A lot of Indians were killed on these hillsides as the railroads were built through here. As we went through the natural tunnel, our mid-train power locomotive lost radio contact in the cave with the lead engine. This put unnecessary stress on the couplers, causing the train to split in half. We put the train in emergency, and once we fully stopped, we determined the train needed to be walked. Normally the conductor would go alone, but Chris was scared, so I decided to walk with Chris, and we walked by the light of his lantern. Our train was two miles long, and we found the broken knuckle, or coupler, about halfway. We fixed the knuckle and I had to leave Chris to return to the locomotive for the reverse slash recoupling maneuver. I was about three quarters of the way back to the lead unit before Chris radioed me, asking where I was. I told him and got no response, but proceeded on. I got on the engine and got ready to make the move. So I radioed Chris, letting him know that I was ready. After about four minutes without response, I repeated myself. After another two or three minutes, I figured the signal came and went in the cave. I radioed dispatch, telling them what was happening, and to be on standby. I grabbed my flashlight and started making my way back towards Chris. Once I got in sight of his lantern, I called to him with a loud echo off the cave wall. All of a sudden, I saw Chris's body go flying from between the cars that had broken the couplers and hit the cave with a loud thud. He slid to the ground as my attention was drawn back to the area where he was launched from. Some thing was standing there. It must have been about eight to ten feet tall. Its head turned towards me with the reddest glowing eyes I've ever seen. As soon as it made eye contact with me, it let out this low, gut-wrenching howl. As I turned to run, it jumped from between the cars and hit the ground with so much power, my legs came out from underneath me. I caught myself and hopped back up and ran towards the lead unit with everything I had. I heard it running behind me. Stomp. 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 It continued to gain on me. The engine was in sight, so I gave every ounce I had and finally dived for the grab iron and steps. I scurried into the cab and locked the doors. I looked around the windows and saw nothing outside. I radioed dispatch in a panic and told them what happened, though I was barely audible. They told me to proceed with what I had left of the train to Big Stone and grab the authorities, and another engineer would be there to relieve me. I put the throttle in run eight, full throttle. As soon as I stepped off the engine, 
My legs became jello and I fell to the ground. As the EMTs tended to me, I looked up at the second unit and saw the same two red glowing eyes looking out the window at me. I passed out after that. I was awoken in the hospital by a very inquisitive detective. He explained to me that they could only positively identify Chris with dental records. Chris had been mauled so badly, they didn't have any animal on record that attacked in that manner. My brain had shut most of it out at the time, so I was useless to the case. As the detective left, he stopped and turned towards me. Oh yeah, do you know anything about the dead 25 year old we found in the second unit? We found him with his chest plate broken and his ribs split open from the center. I passed out after the gruesome detail again. I come to find out a few track workers and hobos that had family that knew their last whereabouts and cared enough to report them missing, disappeared in the area. I was eventually able to get past all this and go back to work. About a week after returning, I was sitting in the Kingsport locker room. An old head sat down beside me and said, you must be lucky. Not so many survive a Wendigo the first time. I transferred divisions a week later. So this happened a couple of weeks ago. I'm a small 20 something year old girl and I just arrived in this country, which I am not going to disclose for anonymity. I had traveled alone on public transport for the first time since arriving and I have some anxiety issues. So it was a big deal for me. I arrived at my destination, which was a part time job interview sort of thing. I did my thing and was ready to leave, but wasn't sure which train to take back. As I was walking along the station, a man begins to leer at me and tries to talk to me. He reeks of alcohol and is obviously intoxicated. I try to ignore him and look at the train schedule. I must look confused as another man about my age from the little I can tell asks me if I'm lost. He's facing away from me, but with his head turned to me. So I can't really see him properly. I tell him yes, I am. And also as an opportunity to get drunk other man to stop talking to me. And he asks me where I need to go. I tell him the rough area where I need to go. And he still hasn't turned around. He then thinks for a while and looks up and down making a comment about my shirt. It's the logo of a popular video game on it that I like to play. And he tells me he also plays. By now I'm being somewhat friendly. Big mistake. He turns around and I can see he's got really busted up hands. It's bandaged and bleeding. And he's got blood on his pants and scratches on his face. Of course. Now red flags are going up and I'm thinking, ah, crap. Who have I started conversing with? I ask him politely what happened to his hand and he tells me not to worry that it's a conversation for another time. He comes up to me and starts hugging me, telling me he's glad he met me and that we have so much in common because my bag also has the logo of another franchise I assume he's a fan of. He asks if I have Facebook and I say yes, but that I don't use social media. Finally, really pressing the subject, he asked me what my username for the game was. And I, panicking because of the adrenaline, tell him the handle but not the correct numbers. The damn ass that I am forgets that it's my social media handle as well for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everything. So by now, I'm feeling sufficiently creeped out and I'm giving him short, curt answers to his questions. Where are you from? What do you do? He tells me that he was in the army and that he can take care of problems and that if I ever have a problem, I should call him. What does that even mean? 
and that he's been beaten up in this city 14 times this year, and how he works for the police. At this point, I tell him I need to go, and he proceeds to follow me. I end up just catching the train I thought was the one for home, but while I'm waiting at the station, he happened to notice my old self-harm scars from when I was a teenager. He grabs my arm so hard, he's making it go red, and stares at the scars before letting go, and then grabs my head and pulling my hair while he crushes my head and shakes it, saying, If you ever do this again, I'll kill you. I know what you're thinking. Maybe I should have screamed or run away, but the few other people at the station really didn't look helpful, and some looked drunk and dangerous. So I thought, either I can scream, and he can pull out a knife and freak out or punch me in the face or something, as I did not know what this guy was capable of, or I can try and stay emotionless and calm, get on my station and try to get home slash the closest police station. He lets go and says, a man would never do that. You'll never see a man with those. Then starts laughing this weird laugh and tells me, you don't have to be scared of me. The train arrives and I go on without a word and he follows me on and sits next to me. I'm the big baby, so I'm too scared to tell him to leave me alone but I am obviously not comfortable with the situation. He keeps hugging me and telling me we're gonna be best friends and that he wants to see me tomorrow and I have to promise him that I'm gonna see him. I shake on it, genuinely afraid of what he'll say if I didn't disagree. He keeps making comments about how he could kill me and about how he didn't mean to break the window but that he was so angry I assumed he was talking about his hand, but I didn't really want to know. Eventually I got to my stop and walked out. Of course he followed me. I turned to him and said, I need to pick up a package now, so I have to go. And he looked at me as though he was going to protest, and started following me when I said, I really have to go now, but we can play some games later, alright? He then said, I'm going to add you. When will you be on? You need to accept me as soon as you get home. To which I tried to smile and assured him that I would. This seemed to be the only way to get him to leave me alone. And he awkwardly hugged me again. And then I sort of pulled away and power walked away. When I got around the corner, I started to tear up and kept looking behind me, scared he was going to be following me. As I was walking home, my stomach churned when I saw I had gotten a friend request from him on Facebook. I hadn't told him my name. He must have, the second I left, googled my game username and found my name somehow. I felt like such an idiot. When I got home, my mum insisted we go to the police to see whether or not this guy has any priors for stalking or violent behaviour. The second I logged into Facebook, I blocked him and changed handles on every social media. He still knows my name, but he's blocked, and I just pray he doesn't try to contact me with another account. The police checked his name and told me he had a few priors for drugs, and I assume he must have been higher than a kite while talking to me for acting the way he was. They contacted him and warned him not to message me or come anywhere near me. And so far, I've heard nothing. I know it sounds ridiculous, but sometimes I have nightmares about him grabbing my head. And instead of just letting go, he drags me away into the surrounding forest. And then I wake up. It's sad, but I have such anxiety on public transport now. And if any man leers at me, or tries to talk to me. I turn and walk the other way. I guess you can't be a friendly person in this world. This happened a couple of weeks into my freshman year at college, and there are still some things that I have never figured out. 
It was 2002, so I was still using my AIM as my main way to chat with people. That said, my AIM username wasn't published anywhere tied to my actual name. Now in college, we get a lookbook with pictures and a short summary of everyone in our year. It'll show proposed majors, hometowns, dorm extension phone numbers, and it does not give your AIM or where you live. Well, so I'm a lesbian freshman from Texas at a small liberal arts slash Ivy college. So I'm far from home, but nestled in a pretty tight knit supportive community. Boy, did that come around to bite me in the ass quickly. So before college, I came out on a show. Back then, way less gays or something. I don't know. And anyway, I was getting recognized. So one day on AIM, I get a chat request from a user I don't know. That was odd, because it happens sometimes, and it could have just been a new friend or something. But no one at my college had AIM. So, I had just started, and was always kind of a loner. This person claimed to be a friend of a friend of a friend from home, and fan of the show, and I thought it was weird she found my AIM. But I didn't look much into it. She basically started out friendly, and even seemingly into me. I wasn't into her. I didn't know this random person, and I had a girlfriend. I tried to let her down gently, but every time I did she would go off on religious rants about how she isn't gay, and I'm going to hell for being gay, and she wants to save me. She would go off on these crazy rants, delete her SN, and come back with a new one try to be sweet, and the psycho would start all over. This happened a few times. I thought she was sad, bored, and a closeted troll. So at this point I'm basically ignoring her random usernames and incoming messages. There are some several a day. She was crying on her own, now being sweet with kissy faces, angered at no replies, and ranting about me burning in hell. Then suddenly new screen name. I just ignored when it popped up. She finally got sick of being ignored and one day tells me, I know XYZ, what I wore that day and the way I walk. All these obsessive little details and judgments about myself, where I eat, my routine, the classes I'm taking. She then drops the bombshell that she is actually a student at my school on campus and of my year. We had the same admissions counsellor, same advisor, and she told me her name. And I ran to the lookbook to see who this psycho was. I was terrified when I saw her photo. Not to judge a book by its cover, but she looked like the lady that killed Selena. Suddenly, I couldn't just block or ignore her. Not fully. She was literally in my circle, by no choice of my own. After she revealed who she truly was, her rants got a little less crazy. Way less burning in hell talk, thankfully. But now I'd meet people and they'd go, Oh, Selena Killer was talking to you. Man, she's a great person. You guys are close. I'm so glad. Anyway, them saying how amazing she was and how lucky I am to have found such a cool friend. Always. I don't know how to react. I wanted people to like me, and to go around screaming week three of college that Selena Killer is crazy and she's stalking me just makes me sound crazy. Especially since there's this weird false comfort of being a predetermined and pre-selected group. It's this idea that people have been vetted or something. I don't know, it's hard to explain. Suffice to me calling her out about this, our peers wouldn't have exactly pegged me as someone who fostered a sense of community. I asked her how she got my username and why she was watching me. She told me that she got it from the flipbook, not possible, and that she wasn't watching, it was just a small school, which it's not, and that I sure think highly of myself. So now I'm thinking, maybe I'm just being arrogant and paranoid. 
One day, at 2 a.m., my phone rings. It doesn't stop. Dorm phone, so no answering machine. I finally answer, annoyed, and it's the girl. I'm freaking out, and she casually goes, Hey, I'm on my way. What? Apartment 420, right? That's your dorm room, right? I flip. Do not come here, I yell down the phone, and hang up. It continued to ring, and I freaked out so much I unplugged it from the socket on the wall. I think she got my dorm from stalking me, but how she got my AIM I still don't know. No one had it on campus at that point, and I searched everywhere for any connection of my name to my username, and found nothing. And I don't know when she saw me, and put me together with the show, and exactly when or how her obsession started. She continued to be a psycho for all four years. I mean, maybe I overreacted, but I was far from home, and only in my first couple of weeks at school. First time adulthood and all that, and suddenly, I was always looking over my shoulder. She did eventually come out in her sophomore year. Shocker. She then dated my very best friend, who wasn't even gay before, and she called me up one day, saying they both wanted to take a little road trip to my hometown in Texas, while I was visiting my family. I got so creeped out, because the creepy little girl just wanted to get off on seeing my family, and where I live and stuff. I strongly suggest to my best friend, who knows the history, and how I'm afraid of her, that I'm not comfortable with it. She assures me that it's totally fine, and that this girl isn't a creep. I tried to cancel several different ways, but it wasn't happening. At one point, they said if they could just crash at my family's house, or if I just wasn't there, they were just going to make the 11 hour trip each way, drive there anyway, just to, you know, do a road trip and see my town, the one I grew up in. My hometown is a shithole, mind you. Well, the creepy girl stayed at my home. My dad barbecued for them. She had such a smug look of satisfaction on her face. Then I realised she stopped being obsessed with me a long time ago, and now just enjoyed making me uneasy and rubbing our connections in my face. They eventually broke up. She isn't a best friend anymore, and I genuinely hope to never see the creepy little woman ever again. And if people could stop saying how awesome she is, that'd be great. I recently started a new job that I absolutely love. I'm a daytime caretaker for an older special needs gentleman. Basically, I pick him up in the mornings and proceed to take him wherever he needs or wants to go during the day. He likes to keep a daily schedule, and that schedule includes us going to the mall every weekday morning at 10 for at least three hours, so that he can walk laps and socialize with the vendors and the other mall patrons. I've been doing this job for just under a month, and within the past week and a half, I've had some increasingly creepy encounters with one specific custodian that works at the mall. I'm not required to stay with my client while we're at the mall, seeing as he is still very independent and capable of doing everything on his own. So last week, Wednesday or Thursday I believe, I was walking around and trying to kill time, while he walked laps and got his exercise in. I happened to walk past a custodian who smiled and waved at me. I returned the gesture just as I would have done with anyone who went out of their way to greet me politely. Little did I know, he was apparently going to take this as an invitation. The next day, I ran into the same custodian. I'm not sure if we just happened to be walking in the same direction, and I didn't notice him at first, which seems more and more unlikely as time goes on. Or if he saw me, and intentionally started walking in the same direction I was going. Either way, he began matching pace with me, and asked me how my day had been so far. I replied with a, 
fine, thanks, and tried to keep on my way. He made a couple of other comments about it being a nice day, while staring directly at me long enough for it to get weird, and smiled this gigantic smile. Eventually, he had to say goodbye to me, and turned down a service hallway. After that, I had a few days off from work, and I didn't go to the mall during those days. And so, the slightly strange custodian didn't cross my mind again, until this past Tuesday, when I went back to work. I picked my client up in the morning, and we drove to the mall as per usual. He approached me again while I was walking, and kept making comments about how pretty I am, and how he just had to come over and make those dimples pop out. I ignored him, save for an uncomfortable laugh that I couldn't hold back. He just continued and kept calling me beautiful and a real cutie pie. By the time he decided to carry on with his own business, I was thoroughly creeped out. Fast forward to yesterday, it was basically just a bunch of the same weird compliments. But this time he was also adamant about asking me a bunch of questions, like why I've been to the mall so much lately, and what I like to do when I'm there, which I didn't give him any answers to. Eventually, he just went away. Then today. Today has to be the day that he made me feel creeped out the most. I was walking past the food court, when he found me yet again. This time I saw him staring at me from afar. When he saw that I could see him, he made an effort to walk past me and say hello, which I promptly ignored, then tried to hurry to the other, more out of the way side of the mall, where I meet my client when he's ready to go home, and hopefully avoid any more contact with creepy custodian dude for the day. Of course it didn't work. When I got to the seating area where I wait for my client, he was surprisingly already there. He told me that he wanted to sit for a while before we left, so I sat in the armchair next to him, and we talked for a while. Now keep in mind, this isn't even 20 minutes after my first encounter of the day with the custodian. I look up, and guess who's walking straight towards me with that same huge smile and stare. The custodian, of course. This time, he positions himself right in front of the chair I was sitting in, which made me super uncomfortable, because I couldn't get up and walk away like I had every other time I bumped into him. He stood there staring and smiling, and said something that made my hair stand on end. You need to stop moving around so much. I didn't respond, and didn't look at him. I just wanted him to go away. He tried asking me more questions about why I was at the mall so often, and when I worked, and even if I lived around the mall. I didn't give him any answers, and just said I needed to leave. He moved, but not before saying again how cute I was, and that he would see me tomorrow. Needless to say, I am thoroughly creeped out. I'd like to go to more security, but I don't know the man's name, as the custodians don't wear name tags, and even if I were able to describe him well enough for them to figure out who I'm talking about, I have no idea what action they'd even be able to take. I'm trying to take every precaution I can, and I've told friends about what's happening, but beyond that, I'm at a loss. I can't change my client's schedule. So I do have to be at the mall every morning, at a predictable time, which I'm sure is only making it easier for this guy to find me if he wants to. If anyone has gone through anything similar, I'd love to hear how you guys resolved it. Also, update. Ever since talking about this, I haven't seen the creepy custodian dude. This may be because I've been spending more time inside stores like Starbucks or Barnes and Nobles, where I can sit and not be bothered, as opposed to sitting out in the open at any of the seating areas in the middle of the mall or food court. Whatever the reason, I've been able to relax a bit and enjoy the time that I have to be at the mall, 
instead of being on edge and looking out for any creepy janitors who want to harass me. In the summer of 2015, I worked at a university in a small southern town. I lived a few miles away from campus in a two-bedroom house with a roommate, and my schedule was pretty rigid. Same routine every day. I went to class in the morning, work in the afternoon, and got home at around 9pm. One Thursday night, I arrived home at the usual time. I noticed that there was an old pickup truck idling at the yield sign across the street from my house. I didn't know the make or model, but it was beat up. Peeling paint, rust, dents. It looked really out of place in our neighbourhood. Most people there drove nice modern cars, so this thing stood out like a sore thumb. The streets were deserted. It clearly wasn't waiting for other cars to pass. I thought maybe the driver was just texting or something, but since my roommate wasn't home yet, I didn't want to leave the safety of my own vehicle. I am a petite woman who doesn't carry pepper spray anymore, so I try to be aware of my surroundings. I pulled into my driveway and just sat there staring at the truck and waiting for it to leave. Eventually it did. It pulled away slowly and made its way back out of the neighbourhood towards the main road. When it was out of sight, I went inside, locked the door behind me and made myself some dinner. By 11pm, my roommate still hadn't come home and I was folding laundry and listening to podcasts in my bedroom. I'd forgotten all about the truck. Suddenly the lights went out. That spooked me, because normally our power didn't shut off unless there was bad weather. That night was clear as a bell, so I immediately called my roommate and asked where he was. He told me he was already on his way home and that he would be there in about five minutes. Relieved, I just told him to step on it and hung up. No reason to freak out about a power outage, right? He'd be there soon enough. And then we could figure it out together. I walked into the living room to wait for him. Our front door had a little diamond shaped window in it, which I've always hated. I stood on my tiptoes and looked out to see if our neighbor's power was out as well. I was surprised to see that it was not. Even the street light near our front yard was still on. Weird. Had I somehow blown a fuse? Just as I considered making a trip to the basement to reset the breakers, I received a text message from my mum. I don't remember what it was about, but it only took me a few seconds to answer it. After I did, I looked out the window again. To my utter shock and surprise, there was a man standing under the streetlight. He hadn't been there before, and I instantly got a bad feeling. He was a middle-aged man, and about six feet tall, with a pot belly and little round glasses, unkept hair, old sneakers. His white t-shirt and blue jeans were filthy. He looked like he'd been working on a car or something. He was mechanic dirty, you know? and he had this awful, smug expression on his face. I had never seen him before. Still in shock, at actually seeing someone out there, I didn't move. Luckily, he couldn't see me, because the inside of my house was pitch black. But to my absolute horror, he was heading straight towards me. Not walking quickly or with purpose, just kind of casually shuffling towards the house. If someone else were to pass by, they probably wouldn't realise what he was up to. He even glanced around a few times, as if to make sure nobody else was watching. Inch by inch. He made his way into the yard. This guy was coming to get me. I was sure of it. I started to shake. I think it's worth mentioning that my dog is very people-oriented and he usually goes bananas when he hears something outside. 
This time it was silent. He had no idea there was a man approaching, even though I was staring at him through the window. When the man was about halfway to the porch, my roommate's car finally rounded the bend and turned onto our street. As soon as those headlights lit him up, the man turned and looked and recognized the approaching vehicle. My roommate and I both saw his face. He recognized that car. In his haste to get away from the house, he nearly stepped in front of it and got run over. My roommate swerved into the driveway, scrambled out and charged into the house. He didn't even speak to me. He just grabbed the axe out of our utility closet and went back outside to confront the man. But he was gone. We called the police and the power company, and they both sent someone to check things out. The police didn't find anything. The repairman reset the box on the pole near our house. Apparently, the switch had been flipped, which is why only our house had no electricity. I asked the repairman if there was any way that a person could have been responsible for that, but he didn't give me a straight answer. The following day, we went on a camping trip that lasted all weekend. If the men came back, we would never know. And after that, I refused to be home alone if my roommate wasn't around when I got off work. I killed time at a local bar until he got back, and we both moved away soon after. I never saw the man or the truck again, but sometimes I wonder, how long had he been watching our house and stalking me? And what might have happened if my roommate hadn't been on his way home that night? Over 10 years ago, when I had just turned 18, we went for a holiday in Vienna, Austria with my friends. As we were young and broke, we chose a cheap hotel near the shopping district. The hotel was nice enough, but there was something eerie about it. It was very old, at least from the 19th century, and all the walls were covered in mirrors. They were differently shaped, and their sizes varied, but they were all mirrors nevertheless. In my culture, there is this belief that you can capture people's souls into mirrors, so this alone creeped me out quite a bit. Me and my friends used to joke about the hotel, and I recall us saying when we first entered that place that it was absolutely haunted. The manager at the hotel was also this sleazy middle-aged man who was way too interested in me and my friends, considering he was probably three times our age and we were a band of barely 18-year-old girls. There was simply something off about him. The way he gazed at us and followed us around the hotel, always offering us something to eat or drink. Maybe he was just being friendly, but he wasn't like that with the other customers. So because of this, we found him somewhat creepy. The hotel did have an elevator, which was ancient and didn't work quite well. I remember that some of my friends got stuck in the elevator for a while, but someone working at a hotel was able to free them soon enough. We learnt this happened quite often with the elevator, so people staying at the hotel usually chose to take the stairs. One afternoon, I was lounging on my bed after coming back from shopping. I was facing the windows, and my back was turned to the door and the other bed in the room. My best friend, who I shared my room with, was still shopping, and I was waiting for her to come back. Suddenly, I heard the door of our room creaking as it was being opened, and then I heard the steps of someone entering the room. Without turning to face the incomer, I started to talk casually, as I assumed it was my friend. But as no reply came, I turned around and there was nobody there. The door to our room was wide open, but no one was at the door. I frowned and got up. My initial thought was that my friend was playing a trick on me, but as I went to the door and peeked into the hallway, there was no one there. The hallway was empty and dead silent. The stairs were on the other side of the hallway, so there was no way someone could get there so quickly and without making a sound. 
The doors of the elevator were open, and no one was in the elevator either. It was a simple hallway, and there were no real places to hide. So I was feeling quite puzzled. At this point, I wasn't even scared. I was more curious. Then I thought that maybe some of my other friends staying at the hotel were trying to scare me. So I took my room keys and headed to the other end of the hallway, to their room. As they let me in, I explained what happened, and they were just as weirded out as I was. The three of them had been staying at their room the whole time, talking about things only 18-year-old girls talk about. You know, boys and stuff. They also pointed out that only me and my best friend had the key to that room. So how could any of them open the door anyway? This was true. The hotel had these heavy ancient keys. No card keys or anything on like that. And only me and my best friend had the keys to that room in question. Also, the locks were so ancient, you couldn't even undo the lock. So you always had to open the room with the key. As I thought about it, the whole situation started to feel weirder and weirder. And thoughts of going back to our room alone made me feel uncomfortable. So I waited in my friend's room for my best friend to come back. When she finally returned two hours later, I explained to her what happened and asked her if she'd been at the hotel during the day. She gave an odd look and told us that she had been at the city centre for the whole day. I believed her, and even if she had her unique sense of humour, she wouldn't pull that kind of prank on me. I tried to explain myself that maybe it was some kind of maintenance person, but this seemed too far-fetched. Why would they just open the door to the room and then go away without saying anything while leaving the door open? Besides, I never saw anybody in the hallway, and I had to pass the bathroom when I exited the room. There was nobody in there either, so there really were no places to hide. I still have no rational explanation for what happened, but I certainly hope that the person entering our room while I was alone in there was rather a passing spirit than a creepy hotel manager. I have to confess that even as an adult woman who has travelled quite a bit because of my line of profession, I still feel uneasy when staying at hotels. I get a lot of creepers. Being a blonde-haired, fair-skinned, blue-eyed foreigner living in Japan, makes me stick out, and I'm often approached by Japanese men, hoping to talk me up and get my contact information. Sometimes though, the most annoying thing can be being approached by other foreigners that assume that just because we are both foreigners, we should automatically become friends. This happens a lot. Sometimes, it's something slightly creepy, like the girl who stared at me non-stop as we were both waiting for our numbers to be called at the immigration office. I pretended I didn't notice and kept my nose in a book. Other times, it's worse. A few weeks ago, I had to go into Tokyo for work. After a long day, I boarded the train and listened to music to unwind, and finally got off at the train in my town. Feet aching from my nice work shoes, and trying not to get a run in my stockings, I carefully made my way through the crowds to the stairs, and started my descent. As I turned the corner to start the twenty-minute walk home, a tall, dark-skinned man of maybe 185 centimetres tall started crossing the street towards me. When he saw me, his face lit up and a large smile crept across his face. Based off the look on his face, I assumed he knew me, or that we had met and I simply didn't remember him. As he got closer, he stepped in front of my path and stopped staring at me expectantly. I pulled off my headphones 
and looked at him. Are you new here? He asked. Okay, so I didn't know him. Uh, no, I replied. I definitely wasn't new. I had lived in this town for over three years now. Really? I come here every day and I've never seen this face. It was the way he said it. Like I was some sort of collectible trading card that he hadn't gotten his hands on yet. My hair stood on end. Where do you work? He pressed. He had a thick accent. But I couldn't tell you if it was Jamaican or Nigerian. I'm not comfortable telling a stranger where I work, I told him bluntly. After being asked this question so many times, I've learnt how to not answer. I'm not a stranger, he said. I'm Max. I kind of just stared at him for a moment, then went to leave. But he blocked my path. I'm not a very small woman. I stand at 167, but he was still towering over me, and was bigger muscle-wise. Do you live in the area? If I wasn't comfortable telling him where I worked, why did he think I'd be comfortable telling him where I lived? The fact that he was keeping me there and pressing me for information obviously had alarm bells going off in my head. My heart was pounding so hard that I could hear it in my ears. I live with my husband, I told him. I didn't tell him where, just that I lived with my husband. My logic at the time was that maybe he would leave me alone if he knew I was married. It seemed to work at first. Oh, he said, looking slightly crestfallen. Do you have kids? No. Why? Seriously, who asks why someone doesn't have kids? We don't want them, I said, going to leave again. He stepped in front of me again. Oh, I see. You mean you don't want kids with him, right? My anger flared over my panic. Who does he think he is? Um, excuse me, no, not right. And if I don't want kids, then I certainly don't have to justify my reasoning to a stranger. But I told you, I'm no stranger. I'm Max. I glared at him, saying nothing for a moment, before I slammed him aside with all my strength and moved on. I could feel his eyes boring into the back of my head, but I didn't turn around until I was across the street and two blocks down. I took the long way home, just in case calling my big brother figure friend on the way. I would have called my husband, but he was at work. I didn't see Max again. I didn't have to go to the station often, so I didn't really have many chances to run into him. Every time I do though, I at least have the comfort of knowing that I have a can of pepper spray securely in my hand. My husband was sure to get it for me after that. So this happened when I was in college. I would often use the computer labs on campus because at the time I didn't have my own computer and a lot of my assignments involved some sort of electronic component. And then I would hang out there or other areas of campus because I didn't really have many friends other than the few I had made there. So I would hang out with them and such. Sometimes, I would be there kind of late, because I also tutored, so it wasn't uncommon for me to be there after dark. During college, I kind of came out of my shell a bit, and was more inclined to talk to people I didn't know. One day in the computer lab, I was working on my latest story, as I've been writing since I was 11, which happened to be a horror story. This one kid whose name I never did get sat down next to me, even though the lab only had a few people in it. I didn't think too much of it, especially when this guy started talking to me. He was actually being kind of flirty, which is, usually, flattering. So I figured he just thought I was cute or something. He really wasn't my type. For one thing, I hadn't realised that I liked guys yet. For another, 
he was kind of emo. That was when emoism was big. And I wasn't really into that anyway. But you don't have to be attracted to someone to talk to them. So I was nice and chatted with him a bit, even though I really wanted to write. Eventually this guy asked me what I was working on, and I told him. He thought it was super cool, and said he was a writer too. And that piqued my interest, because I don't know a lot of writers. So I asked him what he wrote, and he said it was predominantly horror as well. He told me that he was writing a story with his friends in it. That would be a slasher, like Scream. Well, those are interesting to me. And I didn't think much of his friends being in it until he said, I just really wanted to write a story where my friends are like, brutally murdered or whatever. That was verbatim. I remember it very clearly. Well, that was super weird. And he got even weirder when he asked if I wanted to read. I kind of waffled a bit about how not wanting to be rude. And then I made an excuse to leave when he got kind of intense about it. Later that night, I was home, and got a friend request from someone I didn't know. That was during the MySpace era. And this guy's URL and name on the site were Bloodchow666. I knew right away who it was, even before I went to his profile. I was surprised that it wasn't weirder, so I wanted to be polite and accepted his request. That was a mistake. He began sending me parts of his story, and dear God, it was even worse than it sounded when he told me about it. Not only were his friends getting killed, he was writing them in extremely sexual scenarios, and the death scenes were very, very violent. I wanted to stop reading, but my friend Ashley, who'd been in the room when I met this guy, wanted to keep reading it. So I did with her. We were basically WTFing the entire time, because holy shit, it was weird and morbid and dark, and made me extremely uncomfortable. I deleted him eventually from MySpace, and then blocked him, not wanting to talk to him again. Well, this guy wouldn't let go. He found me alone on campus, wanting to know why I deleted my MySpace, which is what I told him and I was worried about what he'd do if he found out the truth. He became very insistent that I keep reading his stories, and he kept following me around, trying to give me pages. I debated telling someone, but I was young and naive, and thought maybe he was just being lonely. However, he was really starting to scare me, especially when he'd find me alone in the parking lot at night. More than once, I had to quickly get into my car and lock the door right away. He didn't exactly chase me, but he may as well have. And then just as suddenly as it started, it ended. I never saw or heard from him again, and I think perhaps he dropped out. At the time I was dealing with a different stalker situation, so I didn't question it. I was just grateful. This happened about an hour ago. I was riding the subway back to my dorm in North Philly, after dropping my boyfriend off at the train station. Being extra cautious on the subway, I sat in the seat closest to the window. A man came and sat next to me, and I glanced over to look at him. As I did this, I noticed a man sitting across from me staring openly at me while playing with a rope in his hand. This wasn't a small piece of rope. It was a thick boating line. I thought it was odd, so I decided to look away. I glanced back periodically, and every time I did, he was still staring, licking his lips and tying knots in the rope. At this point I'm freaked, so I stare out the window. As I do this, I catch his reflection. He's openly oogling me, licking his lips and still tying knots. I get off at my stop for my transfer north and didn't notice him get off. I walk down to the platform 
for the northbound train and sat on a bench next to a kind-looking lady. There was only about a foot or so between us, definitely not enough room for someone to sit down. As I glanced down to check the time, the same man from the train came and sat directly next to me, between the lady and me. At this point I'm freaked, but I didn't want to make a scene, so I scooted over to the edge of the bench and kept my head down. He moved as close to me as he could, mind you, still tying knots in his rope and not looking away from me. At this point I knew something was on. He was a very large man, six foot four, 250 pounds. So I decided to just get up and stand on the platform. He got up directly after me and stood half a step behind my back. I could feel his breath on my neck. I'm in a full blown panic. There are people watching on the platform, but nobody was noticing what was happening. I decided the best thing I could do was walk up the steps and wait for the train next to the ticket booth. He didn't follow me, so I was relieved. When the train came, I walked down the steps and sat between two ladies. He sat directly across from me. He still had the rope in his hand tying knots. The end of the rope was in his hands, while the rest was stuffed in his pockets. The train leaves the station, and he's back staring at me openly. He looked hungry, and not in the way that he wanted a meal. I have no words to describe the look in his eyes, other than terrifying. I've never seen that look before. I tried to call my mum, as a comfort while I waited for my stop to come up but she didn't pick up. I kept my head down, occasionally glancing up to see him unchanged, just tying and untying the rope. At this point, I'm thinking about escape plans. I knew I shouldn't get off at my stop, so he wouldn't know where I lived. When I get to the stop before mine in the busy area, I wait till the very last second to get off the train. The doors won't stop, even if you try to get them open. Right when I hear them start to close, I jump up and sprint out the doors, and I get off right as they close. I look back and saw him try to run off as well. I could see him pressed against the doors, looking at me in the eyes. I've never been more scared in my life. He was significantly bigger than me. I'm five foot five and 160 pounds, and the look in his eyes was unmistakably predatory. I got up onto the streets and I asked another girl walking if she would walk with me to my dorm, because I was so scared. I keep thinking about the what ifs. What if I'd gotten off with everyone else? Would he have followed me? Why did he have the rope? Was he going to kill me? I'm just glad I got off in time, because I know with certainty that he wanted to hurt me. I've never seen that look in someone's eyes before, and have never seen it since nor wanted to. If I hadn't been careful, I know he would have tried to hurt me or worse. I just worry that he might try and do this again. This did not happen to me directly, but it was one of the things that freaked and still freaks me out the most. So this happened about six years ago. On my freshman year in college, I was an experienced 18 year old male that came from a small town with virtually no crime to the suburbs of a big city. I lived right near my university, on a neighborhood that wasn't very bad. Mostly students lived there, and I felt kind of safe. About two miles away, there was quite a dangerous neighborhood, filled with crime and drugs. I even heard a story about a student being kidnapped and held hostage while I was there. I had gone to spend the weekend at my hometown, so I got the bus and it was about 7pm. Since it was around November, it was already very dark out. I always took the train from the bus stop to the university station and then took a 15 minute walk to my house through the campus 
where I felt safe because of campus security. Sometimes I would take the bus with one or two hometown friends that went to the same university as me. But this particular weekend, I was alone. So I got on the train. I saw another freshman that was taking a class with me. I didn't know him very well, but we had talked a couple of times while on the class we were taking together. I greeted him, and since he was focused on his phone, I didn't want to disturb him, so I sat a couple of seats away. This is an important detail. This guy was carrying a rectangular shoulder computer case, which really screams, there's a computer here. Since it was 7pm, there was still a decent amount of people on the train. However, university is the terminal station, so almost only students go there. When we were two stations before, there were about 10 people spread all over the five to six carriages. This all happened very quickly. The doors opened and nobody left that station. Suddenly, two huge guys burst in and grabbed my class buddy. He was focused on his phone right next to the door. I was only a couple of seats from him. Another guy that was inside the train grabbed him as well. When I say huge, I mean they were literally like Dwayne the Rock Johnson huge. I'm not exaggerating. So the guys grabbed him and took him out of the train with his phone and shoulder computer bag. He left his travel bag inside the train. They still punched him once, took his bag and were grabbing him. Luckily, he managed to get off his coat and get back in the train just in time for the doors to close. Nobody on the train reacted because people were spread out and it all happened very fast. My body was pale. I'm very scared. I went to him, asked if he was okay and comforted him. If not for a matter of seconds, those guys would have beaten him and sent him to the hospital. Both of us were scared to death. After that, I took him home and he used my phone to call his roommates because they had taken his phone and keys. I was totally scared and freaked out too. That was the first time I witnessed a robbery, and that kind of gratuitous violence. It really changed the way I looked at the train ride, and I never took it alone again. When I was alone, I took a taxi home, not taking any chances. So huge guys that robbed my buddy? Let's not meet again. This story takes place last summer. I was meeting up with a good friend of mine before we headed off to a barbecue slash garden party. The hosts are pretty renowned for being a pain in the ass to deal with, so we decided to have a few drinks at a local pub just to take the edge off beforehand. I arrived early, got myself a drink, and found a seat inside a quiet corner. I basically spent my entire childhood in pubs local to my house, and can always point out a few of my dad's old drinking buddies whenever I go out. Generally, it's a slight nod of my head towards them. Maybe if it's quiet enough, we might have a quick catch up. The usual stuff about how my dad's doing, or what I am doing nowadays. This time, I was approached mid-sip by a man that I barely recognised, dressed in stained and worn work boots and trousers, and an almost frayed and sun-bleached polo shirt. He sat down opposite me, and asked if I was Jeffrey's boy. I let my guard down a bit, and assumed that I must have met him before when I was younger. So I answered him, and he starts asking more questions, he started with general questions that didn't raise any alarms for me. Like, how old are you now? Where are you working? You living with your parents still? The questions started getting more personal. 
but I brushed it off, as a drunk not being the most subtle in the world's questions, especially regarding my relationship, whether I had a girlfriend or not, whether I was looking for one. And then he switched to asking if I worked out or not, and how I got arms like that. His words, not mine. I took what I guessed was a compliment, and was trying to be polite with him, but began giving bland and as short as possible answers, in the hope that he would get bored or take a hint. That's when he leaned in, and started whispering in my ear, almost about how he ran a small side business. That if I ever needed any extra work, and how if I wanted to meet a nice girl, he employed a bunch of them. At this point, I was sick of him, and being so close to him, I could smell what I imagine a pub toilet smelled like if it were left uncleaned for a month. So I finished my drink, and decided to just wait outside. After a short while, he arrived, and we left for the party. The next day I spoke to my dad about the encounter, and had to describe the man to him. He drew a blank, until I mentioned the rotten sewage smell. Then he burst into a story about how the man was a well-known guy in the pub, and frequented local prostitutes, and was only able to stay because his brother owned the place. How his side business at the time was selling homemade amateur pornography to the regular drinkers. That's when it clicked for me. I believe he wanted to cut out the middleman, and to produce both, and to both produce and sell his homemade DVDs. I just happened to be young, single, attractive, and potential talent, so he tried scouting. After this, I never went back to that pub, and never pursued a career in adult entertainment either. The last I heard of the man was that he was finally barred from his own brother's pub for groping the barmaid. Sometimes you shouldn't talk to strangers, especially if they want to cast you in a homemade porno. I got my first job at 18, at a pretty high-end resort in Central Oregon, as a housekeeper. I wouldn't particularly regard it as high-end, but the resort had rules that you couldn't approach celebrities and ask for autographs in your work uniform. Anyway, I started out being trained for a couple of weeks, and that all went fine, but I would occasionally get nightmares that were based at the resort. I finished training, and was on my own cleaning rooms and suites, and that's when I started getting bad dreams every night in the exact layout of the suites. The suites were kind of laid out like a condo, I think. There was a sitting area downstairs with a TV and couch, then a full kitchen, and in between that, a dining table and chairs. The stairs would lead to an open landing with railing and a bed, or beds if it was a double. This kind of layout started becoming terrifying to me the longer I worked there. I always felt like I was not alone, or that I was being watched. Sometimes, I wouldn't be alone, and someone would snag the vacuum if I had it, or my leads would come early to check on my cleaning. For a month straight, it seemed I was assigned to the rooms I called the Annex, because it was so far away from the other rooms, and was backed up near some tree lines. When I was cleaning out in the Annex, there was a bad electrical storm, and that feeling of being watched, and not alone, was so intense for me, that I sat on the bed, and waited until I felt comfortable to keep going. My lead was asking me why I clocked into that room for so long, and I lied, and said the room was a huge mess, which wasn't uncommon at all, because young snowboarders would stay, and party while they were visiting Mount Bachelor. She said next time to call her, and she'd come and help me clean the room. My feeling got so bad to the point that I dreaded vacuuming the upstairs landing, because I would have to turn my back to the stairs and couldn't hear anything over the vacuum. More than once, 
I would feel so anxious, and then see my lead walking under the landing, and I would jump and then feel relieved, that I really wasn't alone. I eventually found a way to calm my nerves by turning the TV on while I cleaned, but still felt uneasy about the place. My nightmares were mostly about demons or evil things chasing me, or my family, or my family going insane staying in the rooms. I was totally unaware that I was not the only one having nightmares about the rooms. I started carpooling with a co-worker because we came from another town to work at the resort, which was about 20 miles from the town the resort was in. She told me a story that scared me so much, I imagined it vividly and didn't know what to think. She said she had a nightmare that night and that she was in one of the suites. She was walking up the stairs to the landing and says she sees something in the corner. She's not sure what, because it was shadowed where it was standing. The thing was taking Polaroid pictures of itself and the photos were falling at my co-worker's feet. She picked one up and she could see its face. Terrible, pale, with sunken empty eyes and just demonic. I quit after about four months. Not because of the spooky feeling, but because housekeeping is so tedious and cleaning up after strangers got old fast. The tips from nice guests and the pay was great, but yeah, I couldn't do it anymore. A few years back, I rented an apartment from a friend of mine. He had recently brought it and had it completely renovated. He put it up for sale but couldn't afford a buyer, so I offered to rent it in the meantime. After moving in, I realised there was something wrong with the lady next door. She was about 45 but looked much older. She would sit up all night listening to Christian radio shows and talking loudly to someone. It got to the point where I couldn't sleep, so I went over to her place and asked her to keep it down. She opened the door and I got a quick peek. Her walls all had crosses painted on them in different colours and words like Jesus and angels scribbled everywhere. The windows were painted black letting no light in at all. It was damp and yellow, with stained 50-year-old carpets, dog crap and cockroaches everywhere. No dog, though. I asked her to please keep it down. She just looked at me and shut the door. Then she turned up her radio even louder. The next night, I had my girlfriend staying over. I wake up in the middle of the night and see a shadow of a person who's next to the bed, looking at us sleeping. I think I'm hallucinating as I usually do in the dark when I'm sleepy. But then the shadow starts talking. It's my neighbour, and she's holding something in her hand. She broke in during the night, and who knows how long she stood there. You should lock your doors at night, she says and walks out. The next morning, I hear someone making strange noises below my bedroom window. It's my neighbour talking to herself in tongue. She has a plastic bag in her hand with her rotting dead dog inside. It's hot as hell outside and I can smell death from the bag. At this point, I'm scared shitless. She's obviously very insane. I go upstairs and knock on another person's door and ask what the hell is going on. The guy is just as scared as me. Apparently she broke into his apartment one evening as well while he was watching TV with his kids. He got up from the couch to get a snack, only to find her behind the couch, staring at them, holding a power drill. Now I know what was in her hand. At this stage, I'm basically pooping myself. I call the cops, and they know about her. Apparently she's a violent schizo, and she hasn't taken her meds. But they can't force her, 
or enter her apartment without her permission because she owns it. The only thing they can do is get her when she goes outside. I sit up for the next two days, waiting for her to run out of cigarettes. When I hear her leave at 2am to go across the road to the 7-Eleven, I call the cops. They have three cars and a special van over there in less than two minutes. They restrain her and throw her in the van and drive off to some institution. And in less than a minute, it's over. It's like she was never there. I'll never see her again and still have nightmares about her looking at me in my sleep. I am a 22 year old female living in Australia. I live down the road from my local train station. For the last five years, the train master guy who looks to be in his 50s has been obsessed with me. When I was 18, I started my undergraduate degree, which meant getting the train to go into the city most days in the week. In Australia, it's quite normal to not live on campus. He made seemingly normal small talk with me, based on the Beatles top I wore a lot, and we kind of bonded over mutual taste in retro music. So I guess it becomes less innocent than that since. Over time, it became more apparent to me that he singles me out in particular and doesn't seem as eager to talk to other people at the station as he is to talk to me. I will provide a list of the creepy things he has done over the years. When I was 19, I had some uni assignment that involved writing a news article on an event in our local area, and I interviewed him on the Sydney train system. As stupid as this was of me, I gave him my phone number, and he called me up, singing a song that has my name in it. Weirdo move. Also, when I was 19, he said that he wanted me to come into the station room with him, so that we could take a selfie together, to which I awkwardly refused. He's offered me chocolate, to which I've also refused. On another instance, when I was 19, he would come up and hug me out of nowhere, usually when the station was a bit deserted, and kiss me on my breasts. Presumably, that's because I'm a lot taller than him, and his head comes up to my breasts. And bear in mind, I was fully clothed, so I can't say it was directly onto them. Whenever he sees me in my gym tights, he compliments the way I look in them. This still occurs though I'm pathetically awkward and polite to cause a scene over it, and a bit scared of the consequences regarding how he would react. When I was 20, I went on an exchange to England for half the year, and when I came back, he made the biggest fuss, and it was quite embarrassing. I started wearing eyeliner more often last year, and he would make the point of telling me that he thought of me when he was driving the other day, and how much better I look now that I've put more effort into my makeup. Often, he sits down next to me when I'm on one of the seats, and when I move away from him in a subtle way, he will shift over to me. The other week, he had an event at Sydney University, which is where I did my undergraduate, and he took photos on his phone to show me, so that I could reminisce. So I've clearly dug myself into a bit of a hole with this one, thanks to my earlier stupidity. He's not exactly doing anything illegal to me, and certainly nothing that would get him incriminated. Looks like I'm stuck with him until I move next year. So, creepy station master, let's not meet again, even though I'll probably see you later, when I have to head to work. I am 19, and this happened when I was about 14, 15. 
I went on holiday with my mum, my younger brother, and my grandmother. We decided, since it was autumn slash fall in Switzerland, to go to a warm country and chose Turkey for that reason. I wasn't used to the mentality of the Turkish, so I was most of the time embarrassed when they talked to me, at least as long as I was outside of the holiday resort, for example, at a market. When we were inside the resort, I never had problems. Everyone spoke English, and were rather reserved as well. So more usual for me. Anyway, that was until one night at dinner. Being Swiss, we decided before we went on holiday that we'll manage the tip for the staff differently, with Swiss chocolate. So this evening, we are getting served in the restaurant by a young Turkish waiter. He was very nice and always made comments to me. So my grandma decided that it would be best if I'd give him his tip. Not in the mood to argue with my grandma, I did. Big mistake. He then asked for my number and promised me to text me right after his shift and blah blah. I politely said no, since I already had a weird gut feeling about him. My grandma gave him my number afterwards. Thanks, Grandma. So let the creepy things start. He constantly texts me, demanding to know where I am, wanting to take me out to swim at the beach or show me his apartment. At this point, it's important to note that he was 19, four to five years older than me. I always said no, and then decided to tell my mum about it. She laughed it off, together with my grandma, as being cute and adorable while he was getting more and more creepy. He told me he loved me after just a day. He told me he'd moved to Switzerland for me, since he was doing a workshop for being a waiter there and stuff like that. I started to notice that when I was at the pool in the resort, he stared at me from time to time. He even once ran after me and tried to kiss me. I swear I thought my life was gonna end when he ran towards me. As soon as we left the resort to head to the airport, I blocked him on WhatsApp. The story isn't over though. He stalked me. He found me on every social media site and texted me things like, I love you baby, please unblock me, to, you bitch, I'm gonna find you and hurt you as much as you hurt me. I just blocked him everywhere. And after a year of not hearing from him, I thought I'm alright. I wasn't. He somehow found my Skype, on which I neither used my real name nor my phone number, and sent me pictures of him at the Zurich Lake, which is very close to where I live, stating, Hey baby, I'd love to meet up. I miss you. I didn't go to the city for three months. So yeah, this guy's now about 25, and I certainly don't want to miss him again. My mother pretty much said no big deal to all the texts I showed her. And I'm okay now. I got a new number and changed my looks up a bit. And also grew up. Hopefully, it will be the last I ever see from him. I'll begin by saying I live in an apartment building with five connected two-story town homes. My next door neighbor is the last home on the building. He has seemed just like a normal guy so far. He told us he has bipolar anxiety and PTSD. That's fine. I even provided him with some information on how to get some counseling sessions. Last night, my partner and I got home and he was smoking outside his house. Whatever. He had a short conversation with us, and he apologised for his friend getting drunk, and he had to stop him from going on a shooting spree. I didn't hear anything. It was weird, but we were both tired from work, so we just kind of wrote it off. Fast forward. My partner and I had been laying in bed for about 30 minutes. It's 2am and we hear a knock. 
I feel like, deep down inside, I wanted to believe it was the neighbor's door. Maybe a friend had come over. Another knock. Oh no, that's definitely our door. Another knock. Another knock. There became less and less time between each knocking. My partner and I are looking at each other. We don't know what to do. This was the sixth or seventh knock at this point. As we open our mouths to discuss our options, there's an insanely loud bang. This guy is either hitting or kicking our door so hard that the windows are shaking in their frames. And that's when the howling started. Guttural, demonic howling, screaming, horrific moaning. My partner grabs my best chef knife and I curl myself into a corner of my hallway, unsure of what to do. Call 911? Yes, he says. Call now. My partner is braver than I, and went down the stairs and to the door. Through the window, my partner says, It's 2am. We're sleeping. What are you doing? And just like this, weird old Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, he snaps back to his normal personality, and just says in his meek voice, Oh yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, and walks away. What in the ever-loving heck? So my partner comes back upstairs, and we are both just tucked into the corner of our hallway, listening to this guy's footsteps in the attached unit. It seemed like forever for the cops to arrive. It was probably 20 minutes, but I'm just semi-hyperventilating in the corner of my hallway with a chef knife in hand's reach, just listening. I don't know what I thought would happen. I just didn't want him to come back or have another episode, so I listened. The cops came and I talked to both parties, contacted my landlord this morning. Apparently this guy had already contacted the landlord to complain about the noise we were making. Um, what? So even though he's still my neighbour for the time being, I hope not to meet him again. <laughs>